You're listening to the Sunday podcast from Life Point Church in Santan Valley, Arizona. We hope you are encouraged by today's message. For more information, visit us online at lifepointaz.com. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. We are in the third week of our Advent series. We have covered hope, we have covered joy, and now I have the inenviable task of covering love. Ugh. Love. What hasn't been said about love? What don't you already know about love that I could possibly share with you this morning, right? Or that Hallmark hasn't completely beaten to death, especially Christmas season. Seriously, people, Hallmark Christmas movies may be the devil's tool for you ladies. Maybe. I'm not preaching that as gospel truth, but it is. So this morning's message is called for the love of all that's holy. And if you sense sarcasm in there, you're right. Uh, It's what I say whenever you're upset at the children. You're like, for the love of all that's holy, stop doing that to your sister, right? Um, For the love of all that's holy, God sent his son. For the love of all that's good, for the love of all that's redeemed, for the love of all that's perfect, God sent his son. And so we're talking about love this morning, but not in a way that... Songs talk about it, not in the way that movies talk about it, not in the way that even we sort of long and search for it, but in a way that we often don't see how God loves us, right? We know that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. We know that we're to love God above all others and put nothing before him, but what is Christianity about? I mean, what's it really about? That's what I want to talk about this morning. So Matthew 1 Verses 18 through 25 reads like this. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Now because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. After he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, Son of David, do not be afraid. Take home, take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, that a virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, took Mary home as his wife, but had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? God, help us see truth. Help us to apply truth. Help us to see what you have done, how you pierced our reality in order to be a relationship with us, in order to be Emmanuel. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said, amen. Amen. Okay, so here we are in this section of scripture, and Joseph's life has always impressed me because here's Joseph, and Mary tells him, hey, Joe, I'm pregnant. He's like, what? Right? I'd imagine that was quite a bit of a shock to him, and he, still loving her, decides, okay, I'm not going to drag you through the city square. I'm not going to drag your name through the mud. Let's just part our ways quietly, you and the baby, because it's clearly not mine. You go that way, I'll go this way. And then an angel comes to him and says, hey, Joseph, it's okay. That's the Holy Spirit. Uh, God's working something. You know, that Messiah that the prophets have been talking about that you know of, that your forefathers have studied, that, that David from whose lineage you're from. Yeah, that's him. This is him. This is that Messiah. He's come to save us. He's going to save the people. And I want you to name him Jesus, which means salvation, God's salvation. That's what Jesus means. Now, here's what's second. (laughs) If the most difficult thing was believing that the Holy Spirit impregnated your wife and not some random guy, and because you know it wasn't you, right? The second hardest thing was he said, you shall name him Jesus. In that culture, in that time, for a man to name his firstborn son was about the greatest honor he had to place the name Joseph Jr. or to place his father's name upon the son or something else. But now to be told, not only is the boy not yours, it's of God and you will give him this name, is 
tremendous courage and unbelievable humility on Joseph's part. I had someone say to me a few weeks ago they wanted to talk about Joseph, and if you read through the Bible, there's not too many good fathers in the Bible, right? Go ahead, take a moment, try to think of a good father. They're all pretty rotten. They do some terrible things. They uh, take off. They don't, you don't really see fathers playing catch with their kids. Um, but Joseph is actually an incredible example of a father. We know that he works alongside Jesus in his trade and teaches him his craftsmanship as a carpenter. We know that he stood up for his wife, and even though uh, she would have received and he would have received unbelievable rebuke in the city of Nazareth where they brought Jesus up, and he stood up and he stood beside her and received that same rebuke himself. We know that he loved Jesus fiercely. We know that he cared for him and looked after him. He looked after the very thing that was looking after him. So if Jesus means salvation, God saves. Messiah is the Christ, meaning anointed one. And we have King of kings, Lord of lords, over all. Emmanuel means God with us. And this was God's desire. This was the creator's desire that from the very beginning, he could be with us that he would pursue us. When God created Adam and Eve, what's it say? It says he was with them in the garden, not just he created them and said, go to town, have a blast, enjoy the creation. But he actually came and spent time with them because it was his heart to spend time with the part of creation that was made in his likeness, in his image. He walks with them and communes with them and enjoys this relationship with them until one day his spirit comes to the garden and it says they were hiding from him. And he asks them this question, this question of not literally where are you, but Adam, Eve, where are you? What happened? Why aren't you excited? Why aren't, you, why aren't we talking and, and, and aren't you looking forward to this? Isn't this something you enjoyed as well? You see, one of the things we often forget is that it was not God who hid from man, but man who hid from God. God's not hiding from you. He's not hiding from you today. He's not being quiet when you're asking him questions. He's not being difficult when you're seeking for answers to some of your current problems. God does not hide from his creation. No, we hide from him. We're the ones who walk away from him. So in Genesis 3, 9, when he calls out and he says, Adam, where are you? What happened? Where is your heart? Where is your mind? Moses tells the people, if you seek the Lord your God, you will find him. If you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul, you will see him. Deuteronomy 4, 29, God is there waiting to be found. And in fact, he's not just waiting apathetically. He's, just, he's not just sitting on a throne up in a cloudy heaven waiting for you to make the journey to him. No, in fact, he is going to come and pursue after you. He wants to be with you, and he will make the journey. He will fight for you because, because he loves you. And again, that word love has lost so much meaning in our culture. I mean, I tell my wife I love her, and then in the same sentence, I'll be like, but I really love this pie. You know, you ever do that? You're like, oh my gosh, I love pie. And then you turn around, and you're like, I love you, babe. You just put me on the same level as pie. Now, in my defense, the pie was really good. And when it's warmed up with a side of vanilla ice cream, it's just about perfection. If you seek the Lord your God, you will find him. So it's tough for us to understand true love, true sacrificial love beyond an emotion, beyond an adrenaline, beyond that feeling when you, when you hold hands for the first time. Not like this, but like this. Remember that? I do. You get all tingly. You're nervous. Your heart's beating. Your body's going... Warning, warning, <laughs> danger ahead. And you're like, I don't care. This is going to be awesome. Speaking of that, why is it 
that the times we should be running to God are the times we run away from him. Like when we're struggling with something or, or we've had a week where we really gave in to a temptation that we know we shouldn't have and then it gets to Saturday night and we're like, mm, better stay away from God for a few weeks. Let this whole thing blow over. If I wait for a few weeks, I think he'll forget about it. I'll feel better about myself. I'll get myself back on the right track. You know you do this. And then I'll come to church. And then I can sit there and I can sing to him. And hopefully the pastor won't be talking about the thing that I've been messing up with. See, I know this because I grew up in the church. And I can remember... Uh, as I was starting to like girls there around 16, 17 and having the freedom to go out with them one night, uh, I was with a young lady and we kissed a lot and we danced. And here's the thing, when you grow up Baptist, the dancing was worse than the kissing, okay? There was more fear in being found out. And when I say dancing, I literally mean dancing. It's not a euphemism for something else, it's dancing. We danced. And I said to myself, I can't go to church tomorrow. Like, what will people think? Like, how will I feel sitting there? Hopefully, they don't talk about, you know, SDX. So I go to church, and you're sort of sitting there, right? And I kissed a lot last night, the French kind. And <laughs> so shameful. They had no intentions of marrying her. And, uh, and the pastor goes, open up your Bibles. This morning, we're talking about sex. And I'm like, oh, come on! <laughs> And the whole message was just like, you just sank, sank deeper. And all I could think about was the dancing, you know. That's how I danced. So I felt like it was more of a sin to dance badly than it was to actually dance. But I remember thinking, the church is the last place I want to be. I have sinned against an almighty God. Surely I will be smitten. And not in the good way. In the vengeful way. And yet there's nothing in Scripture which says that about God's character, about Christ, Emmanuel with us. Emmanuel with us. Well, of course there is. God smites people all the time, and people are struck down for disobeying him. Why did God send his son? Why is he called Emmanuel with us? Why does it say that he knows every tiny detail of your life? even the number of hairs on your head, if you aren't so important to him that he's willing to die for you. The Bible says no greater love than this, that a friend lay down his life for a brother. No greater love. God says, I am with you. It is actually God's most frequent promise all throughout scripture. We see it in Genesis with Adam and Eve, I am with you. In Genesis 5, we read that Enoch walked with God. God made the same promise to Noah, Abraham, and Sarah, Jacob and Joseph, Moses, David, Mary, his disciples, and Paul. Over and over, Jesus' reminder is, I am with you. You do not have to walk this life alone. You do not have to go where I'm asking you alone. He says to Moses, right, I need you to go back to Egypt. And Moses says, I'm a stuttering, murderous fool. You can't possibly want me to go back to Pharaoh on your behalf, God says, I do, and I'll go with you. Moses, I will go with you in your weakness. I will go with you in the thing that you fear the most. I will go with you. When I came out here five years ago, that was my prayer with, to God. I was unprepared. I was unqualified for the position as a lead pastor. And I said, God, I will go, but only if you go with me because I will fall flat on my face there. I don't know how to do this, and I don't know what I'm doing. He goes with us because the Lord's promise is I will be with you. As they entered the desert, Exodus 13, 21 through 22, says this, By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. God is constantly with them. Look at Joshua, right? This young man who's supposed to take over for Moses, take over the leadership of the people, lead them into the promised land that which he saw and said, we can take this and for the Lord. Joshua's scared, he's terrified, and the Lord says to him, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. 
Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua, take that territory for me. I go with you. And Jesus' last words to his disciples after giving them the Great Commission was this. I am with you always to the very end of the age. And I will send my spirit so that you will never be without me. See, here's the thing. You don't have to face anything in the upcoming year by yourself. You don't have to face any disappointment. You don't have to face any addiction or struggle. You don't have to face loss. You don't have to face career change, financial difficulties alone. But so often we get that confused and we look at Christianity and our, and our walk with the Lord as, as us attaining to this relationship with God and attaining to some level where we can make him happy enough that he will in turn bless us because we're being righteous. In fact, Psalm 9, 9 through 10 says, The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Have you ever felt forsaken by the Lord, though? Have you ever felt that he doesn't hear you, that he doesn't care? Have you ever laid your your entire life in his hands and said, Lord, I am going to step out in this venture. I am going to trust you. I'm going to trust this other person with my heart. Is this the right person, Lord? I'm going to trust my my family and and my whole well-being to this career and move everything I have. I'm going to trust this investment opportunity, and I have prayed to you, and I feel like you're telling me, yes, God. Have you ever done that and then had him let you fall flat on your face? Had it ripped right out from underneath you? Anybody? Am I the only one? And you look at a verse like that and you say, never forsaken me, huh? I know you have forsaken me. I put my hope in you. You said our child would be okay and they weren't. You said our finances would be okay and they're not. You said my relationship with my spouse was given to me by you and yet it is broken. I feel forsaken. And here's what the Lord has shown me in that. The Lord has told me, Nathan, he calls me Nathan. I have never forsaken you. I have forsaken your plans, but I have never forsaken you. Because your plans aren't that good, son. Your plans weren't that well thought out. And I know it's been difficult. And I know you haven't always liked it, and I know you haven't always understood, but I have never forsaken you. In the struggle in the pain, in death, and in sickness. I have stood by you and loved you and upheld you. In the moments you thought you were courageous and brave, in the moments you saw yourself pull it together and achieve something greater than yourself, where do you think you got that power from? I have never forsaken you. I'm telling you, when you get to a point where you see your creator like that, And the only way to get to that point is to understand this. I do not seek after God. He seeks after me. The Bible says none seek, none pursue, none love, none are righteous. Romans 3, 3, I think. None pursue, none seek. When I understand that Christianity, hear me on this, is not about man's pursuit of God, but it is about God's pursuit of man. That is what Christianity is about, and that is why it is so different than any religion this earth has to offer you, than any sort of power or fame or any sort of chakra or vortex or well-being or anything you can think up is because all of those are man's pursuit of a God or a greater power or a greater source of energy. They're all the same thing. But Christianity comes and says, no, I'm not about that. This is about the creator, the ultimate being, the ultimate source of energy, pursuing you, sacrificing for you, 
humbling himself for you. That is how worthwhile you are. You're that worth it. And, and we get lost in this fact that I'm, pr- I'm pursuing God. I'm pursuing my relationship with God. I'm working on it. I hear that all the time. I'm working on my relationship with God. Cool. How are you doing with just receiving the fact that he is pursuing the snot out of you? I mean, he is going after you like crazy. Have you thought about that? Have you meditated on that? That he will stop at nothing to be with you. He will, there is no stronghold in your life that he won't strike down. And sometimes those very things that we put before God and we pray that he would bless is the very thing he's like, oh, this is going to be rough because I'm actually going to strike that down. And I know you're praying to have me bless your finances, but you've got to understand finances are the thing that are keeping you from me right now. And I love you so much, I'm going to strike them down. And you'll see that. You will. Oh, that's that hard truth. Right now, there's some of you in here thinking, why is he saying finances? Move to something else. Do the sex stuff. I'm fine there. (laughs) Stop talking about money. It's Christmas time, and I have none of it. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. There it is again. You are with me. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. God with us. You can never be alone, even if you want to be. Didn't David say it? Where can I go to be away from your presence, Lord? I like that because we often look at that as a reassuring thing, right? Where can I go? Neither depths nor heights, neither. I can't go to heaven or hell. I can't go anywhere without being in your presence. But I've often read that as a, God, why can I not get away from you? There is nowhere I can go where I can just be alone, right? You are always there. You are always a part of me. You are always with me. And whenever I just want to forget about you and do my own thing and lose myself to my own temptations and and passions that I want that aren't of you, I can't because you're always there. I sometimes look at that verse like that. But maybe it's more reassuring to look at it the other way. So the question is not whether or not God is pursuing you. He is. From Genesis to Revelation, that's all it's about is God's pursuit of you. But it's will you let him? Are you willing to let him in? You see, God is a respecter of persons. He is not a marionette and you at the end of his strings. He gives you a choice. He lets us choose to walk away from him. Doesn't mean his presence isn't there. You hear me that? You can walk away from God, and it does not mean his presence will leave you. Think about that for a moment. You can leave him. You can curse him. You can deny him. You can renounce him. And you cannot leave his presence. Isn't that humble? I feel like that's that eternity thought when you try to think of how long eternity is, and you're like, it keeps going and going. There is nothing I can do. There's nothing you can do. Not everyone loves his presence, and some would prefer to walk their own path, but it does not negate the fact that he is interested in you and is still pursuing you. There's a book by John Ortberg that I got to read recently that had an illustration in it that I so, so loved and held on to, and so I want to share it with you this morning as we're talking about the love of God for you. There's a painting created by one of the four turtles named Michelangelo. He had an ancient ooze fall on him, and he learned karate from his master splinter. Uh, It's in hesitations, but the point is, Michelangelo did a painting called The Creation of Adam. And in The Creation of Adam, it's in the the 16th chapel, uh, the Sistine Chapel, and there are lines every day of every year to come and see this painting. There it is. And in it, I want you to see that what I've been talking about for the last 20 minutes, Michelangelo put into a painting, a visual painting. But look at, look at God's eyes. God's eyes are fixated on his creation. He's staring intently at Adam. He is stretched out being held up by the angels as far as he can from the heavens down to us. 
His arm is completely at reach. He has distorted his body to get there, and he's got his finger just an inch away from Adam. Everything about him is fixated on pursuing his creation. Now, in contrast, look at Adam. He's just like, he didn't even bother to get dressed for the meeting. <laughs> Come on, right? Like, God's coming, and you're like, whatever. But he's reclined, he's leaned back, and look at his hand, it's just like this. He's like, mm. that's, God, that's the picture, that's our relationship with God there. Man is reclined, sitting back, God is reaching down to him with everything he has, and all man has to do is lift his wrist. God is not reaching down and grabbing onto the wrist of Adam. He says, Adam, I'm right here. I'm right here. There's no picture that more beautifully illustrates Unfortunately, our relationship with God is that we feel on a day-to-day -day basis like we are God in this picture. I'm reaching out to God and I'm trying to be moral and I'm trying to be good and he's just not there. And if he's so far away from me, no, you're not. Just take that for a minute. Stop and say, what do you mean, no, I'm not? Take a deep breath and humble yourself for a second and say, if all of Scripture is leading and pointing to the fact that God is with me, that God is pursuing me with everything he has, and yet I am sitting here this morning saying I don't feel his presence, I don't hear his voice, I don't know what his will for my life is, is it really him not with you or you not with him? Let's just think about this logically. I don't hear his voice. I don't sense his presence. Maybe because your position towards God is more like Adam's and less like God's. We feel as though we are the ones reaching out to God. And yet the truth is, if I go five more minutes longer than I should, there will be the subtle look at your watch to be like, pastor's at an hour. But if the football game goes into overtime. You throw your hands up and rejoice. Free football. Extra innings. Free baseball. I make that joke not to condemn anybody or, or shame anybody, but for us to see that even as your pastor and the hours I put in to working with people and counseling and, and working on a sermon to help teach, I look and say, even in my heart, I see myself like Adam even in the midst of a week that is all about God and his kingdom and his church, I sense my heart fighting being like Adam. Just sort of like, yeah. God, there's all these other things I kind of want to do rather than spend some time with you right now. Hopefully that's more convicting than it is condemning. Because my final point is this. God is closer than we think. He's never further away than a prayer. He's never further away than you getting on your knees and saying, help. He's right there, even right now. Right now, he's here with us in our midst. One thing our staff prays every Sunday from 5.30 a.m. through the service, our prayer team is praying during the service. They're praying before the service. God, would your presence be here in our midst? We love you. And, and we want to know you more. Help us in our unbelief. Remember I said from Genesis to Revelation, this is the message. Revelation 3, 19 through 20 says this. The Lord is speaking of the church at Laodicea, and he says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. God is knocking. And we... I have fallen into the trap of saying, where are you, God? He's like, I'm, I'm knocking. I'm the guy at the door. Go answer it. I'm right here. And in this sentence, he's talking to believers in the church. You hear me? He's not talking to the unsaved person saying, where is God? I can't find God. He's talking to the believer who says, where is God? He says, I'm standing at the door knocking. Your life is so loud, you can't hear it. You ever had the music up really loud or a movie really loud and 
you end up feeling your phone vibrate and it's somebody you were expecting. They said, I'm at the door. I've been ringing the doorbell for the last five minutes. That's our way with God sometimes. Our life is so loud, we don't hear him knocking. And so he has to call our cell phone. It's a terrible analogy, I know. Philip Yancey in his book Prayer writes this, when I'm tempted to complain about God's lack of presence, I remind myself that God has much more reason to complain about my lack of presence. Next time you judge God or condemn him for not being present, that's when you should be careful of the lightning. Not coming to church after you've sinned. You're supposed to come here after you've had a rough week. You come here, talk with people, pray with people, confess it, and then move on from it. So remember not to leave him out of your life. Talk to him every day because it takes courage to admit that you're a sinner. You hear me? I know that seems a little bit opposite. It takes courage to admit that you're a sinner. To lay down your old self, to, to admit that you are a moral failure, to admit that you are alienated from God, to admit that you can't walk this righteous path on your own. You can't seek it out. You can't do enough good deeds. It takes courage to say that. Just like it took courage for God to come down and take the form of man, to subdue himself to the beatings and the betrayals and the abuse and the mistrust and the lies so that he could always be Emmanuel, God with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, needing and wanting your presence. If that's your prayer in here this morning, I encourage you, you just pray. You say those words wherever you're at. I need and I want your presence, Lord. Forgive me. Forgive me where I have sinned. Walk with me. I repent and I turn. Lord, help me, Lord. I pray this morning, Lord, as we're a week out from a day where we celebrate your birth, we celebrate this moment where you pierced our reality where your presence was no longer contained to the ark, where no longer was your Holy Spirit placed on certain prophets or teachers or kings or judges, but was made available to every man and woman, every child that would call upon your name. Forgive me for minimizing that. Forgive me for putting the morals and the rules ahead of your pursuit of me, Father. Help me see that. Help me live by that. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to partake of communion here. We have three stations up front and three in the back. We also have prayer partners up front on both sides who would love to pray with you about whatever is going on. Our only requirement to take communion here at LifePoint is that you have a relationship with Christ. I don't care about your denomination or background, but that you've given your life to Christ, repented of your sins, and said, you are Lord of my life. If you haven't, would you come talk with someone today? Be bold, be courageous. I told you it takes courage. It's not for the timid. Remember when Jesus said to the crowd that was sitting around him who was all happy to be his followers, happy to be associated with the guy who was raising people from the dead and healing blindness and healing uh, people with crippled arms and legs. And it was exciting to be a part of his crew. And then one day he said, you can't be a part of me unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And then a few days later, he would be in the upper room with his disciples and he'd break bread they all had a piece, he's told them, take this and eat, for this is the flesh of my body, sent to save man. And when they had eaten of it, he took the cup, and he passed it to each of them and said, take and drink, for this is the blood of the covenant, the new covenant that I shed, that will wash away sin. Do this in remembrance of flesh and my blood. 
So when we partake of communion here at LifePoint, when we're gathered together as a community, my, my hope is that you would take a moment and examine your heart. That you wouldn't just partake of the elements because it's part of what you do, but that you would sit down and say, Lord, where am I? Just as he said to Adam and Eve in the garden, where are you? Lord, where am I? Not where are you? That's often what we want to do. Where are you, Lord? Lord, where am I? Because if you could show me where I am, then I could see where you are. So let's pray and bless this now, and then you can get up, go to one of the three stations up front or three in the back, whatever's closest to you, and we'll close in worship, okay? Heavenly Father, we pray a blessing over this juice and this bread. Without you, Lord, it's just juice and bread, but when we come together and we partake of communion in remembrance of you, it's your flesh and your blood that we receive unto ourselves that we would not forget the sacrifice of Emmanuel, God with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead, come forward. If during this time of coming forward you want to speak to a prayer partner or stand off to the side, you can do that as well, okay?